Praise God. Well, hallelujah. Sister, I'm going to let you go ahead and turn us to Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to just read verses 1 and 2. Hopefully you don't mind this little apparatus. I bought me a, a, a weight belt because I wanted to start running with my weight belt. And I hope you don't mind if I get a little bit of exercise while I'm up here preaching. I know it's kind of strange, but I just want to go ahead and, you know, put this weight on me. You going to be all right with that or is that too weird for you? No. Oh, yeah. I can, brother. I can do it. Praise God. Hallelujah. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 12, and we're going to read verses 1 and 2. Amen. It says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. In verse 2, he says, Looking unto Jesus... The author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. You know, I, I didn't really, wasn't planning on spending a lot of time on verse 2. My, my message this morning is titled, Weights and Sins. And what I, but, what I did, but I do want to mention something about verse 2 a little bit. I want to mention a couple of things. Number one, he is the author and the finisher of your faith. I can remember a time when the Lord revealed to me that, listen, when an author writes a book, you know, unless he has a little ghost writer or a little friend on the side, he, begin, he, could, he comes up with the introduction and he writes it all the way through to the conclusion. And the Lord wants you and I to know that I am the author and the finisher of your faith. I am the one that came to even bring the faith to the next level whenever I, the word and love of God, came from heaven, from another realm, and entered in. I am the light of the world, and I came to bring my light to be able to spread it to all mankind. When I died on the cross and resurrected from the dead and ascended to the Father, he said, it is expedient that I go, for if I do not go, he, the comforter, will not come. And then he came. He's the one that's called alongside to help, according to the Greek. He's, along, he's called alongside your side to help you. He, and, 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 and he brings the word of God to you, and when you receive it, that's the beginning. That's the author writing the introduction that, that now you've been introduced to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. There's a long journey until you get to the conclusion, but he is the author and the finish of your faith. I want you to know that this morning because sometimes we find ourselves in seasons in our walk with God. And we wonder, how am I ever going to get out of this? Why am I so weighted down? Why am I so burdened down? Listen, Christianity is about a marathon. It's a race. Oh, we're going to see it. It's in the scriptures. It's a race, but it's a marathon. It's not just a sprint. Yes, there's sometimes in a marathon, you might have to sprint up a little bit. But guess what? It's a long enduring, trialing race. And there's trials and tribulations along the way, but I got good news for you. Hallelujah. He is the author and the finisher of your faith. Amen. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He endured the pain, the shame, the heartache, the sorrow. He despised the shame. You know, do you think that anybody wants to hang naked on a cross and have the world laugh at them and have religious leaders laugh at them and scoff at them? And, and there he, he knows, he, I can call a, a legion of angels and just demolish everybody here. But he's, he's meek and he's lowly and he's humble because our master, our king came to show us the way. And the way that Jesus came to show us is a way of humility and self-sacrifice and the giving of life. And yet so many times it's difficult for us to learn these things because we have something on the inside of us that tells a different story. Lord, help us. But I want you to see this part. He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I want you to see that, and I want you to ponder that for a moment. I, again, this is not even really having to do with my message, but listen, I had all 13 verses up there, and the Lord was like, son, I told you to preach on weights. I even did a strike through on sins because the Lord wants me to focus on weights. God wants you to know that there's been weights that have tried to connect themselves to you through your journey of life. But at the same time, some of these passages are so good, you can't hardly like pass them up. He says it right there. He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now that means something, friend. 
Theologically, that means something. And if we don't know the word of God, we won't even understand what it means. We'll just read right over it and move on to the next verse. And we'll miss something so profound and so powerful according to the word of God. And let me just tell you this. The book of Hebrews also says that those priests of the Old Testament, they never sat down. You know why they didn't sit down? Because their work was not done. Their work was not completed, but the work of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, hallelujah, his work is completed, and he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and the right hand represents power. And I'm here to tell you this morning that the Jesus we serve, the God we serve, desires to release, no, he's already released power for his people. He's already released power for his people. He wants you and I to have the faith to be able to pick it up. To be able to pick up the sword that he purchased for us. To be able to pick up the armor that he purchased for us. And for us to be able to walk forward and to do the things of God. (coughs) Excuse me. So I want to intro a little bit just the context of the book of Hebrews. Not going to be long with this part. You know, in the context of the whole book, nobody really knows who exactly wrote the letter. I believe it was Paul. There's a lot of reasons why people are conflicted about that. That's not what's important right now. But nevertheless, whoever wrote it, they were obviously new things about the Old Testament and interconnecting it to the New Testament in a way like many of the New Testament writers did not understand. But the context of the book is this. Christians are being persecuted. Christians that used to be Jews are being persecuted now that they've converted over to Christianity by their own people. Like there is literally writings that show that in ancient Judaism, whenever people were converting to the faith, church history talks about it, that they would literally, a Jewish man would possibly have a funeral for his son if he converted to Christianity, signifying that in his mind, his son was now dead to him. That's the kind of thing that was going on. Now, your people might get thrown off with you a little bit for a little while. When you give your heart to Jesus, and they might always be irritated to, with you. And some of them might have completely shunned and forsaken you. But for the most part, they're not going to go that far with it. But that's what it was like. Rome was against them. The Judaism was against them. Their own family was against them. And they were being persecuted. And not everybody was rich. And they, they were under the heavy taxation of Rome. And they, they were hungry. And they didn't have the things that they needed. And listen, when you find yourself in the midst of a famine and persecution and frustration, the liar will always try to make you go backwards. He's not going to quit. The enemy, Satan, will never stop trying to make us quit. And the temptation is for them to go back to their former life, their former beliefs. That ought to sound familiar to you. That ought to ring true in your heart. I'll not even have to transition to that one. How many times has the enemy told you it really wasn't that bad back when I was in the world? That wasn't that a lie? You think that just for one split second, let him bring you back, and then you're going to remember real quick how bad it really is out there. Oh, it's temporarily numbing the pain and the frustrations through the things that life offers. But then you find yourself trouble on top of trouble. Because Satan is a liar. The adversary is trying to keep us away from God's will. Satan will never stop trying to make us quit. And sadly, people are prone to quit. Are they not? I mean, listen, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about human beings in general. People are prone to quit. Right? When, I mean, when times get tough, people are prone to quit. But can I tell you something spiritually This is fertilizer for fruit, my friend. When you find yourself in the midst of the trial, to learn the concept of endurance. We've been praying in this church for a long time. Lord, send your gifts. Manifest your presence, Lord, in the midst of our services. And I believe God's going to do more of that. But let me tell you, Corinth was full of gifts, but Paul called them carnal. Why you should be eating meat, you're still sipping milk. You like this preacher, you like that preacher, and you like that preacher. Paul's just saying, I just wish that we'd all speak the same thing, that we'd speak the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Times when they're tough are fertilizer for fruit, my friend. The Lord even said it in a parable. The tree wasn't growing right, and I'm shooting from the hips, so forgive me. And the master said, this tree isn't producing any fruit. I want it off my property. No, Lord, let me dung it. <laughs> let me throw a little fertilizer on it and give me another year with it, and then we'll see if it produces or not. The Lord, seated at the right hand of the Father, ever make an intercession. That's what I feel like I can hear him saying. That. Give me just a little bit more time with Matt, Lord, Father. Just a little bit more time with Let me put a little bit of fertilizer 
fertilizer around this thing. Let me, let me allow some trial and tribulation. Let me kind of work some things out and make him come. If he don't want to come easily, let me put that bridle on him. The proverb says, don't be like a horse or a mule that will not come to his master without bitter bridle. But sometimes, Lord, sometimes I need you to put a bit bridle on me because I'm hard-headed and I'm rebellious. Lord, save me from my hard-headed and rebelliousness. We want it easy, but the fruit of the Spirit is endurance, patience, long-suffering. It's in those times whenever the Lord is doing the work in our hearts and lives. And that's not the way, you know, a person doesn't develop the fruit of the Spirit by quitting. Amen. So the context of chapter 12 is actually chapter 11. So that's the context of the book, but the context of chapter 12 where I read to you about the author and the finisher of your faith, about laying faith, about laying aside every weight and sin. The context is found in chapter 12. And the main idea of chapter 12 is that there's a cloud of witnesses that we heard about in the first verse of chapter 12, right? That, I mean, the main concept of chapter 12 is a cloud of witnesses. There's a cloud of witnesses that have gone before us. What is a cloud in the sky? It's the first time I ever kind of thought about that. It, it, it's a sign before the rain. Right? I mean, there's moisture in that cloud. I know there is. And sometimes when it gets dark, it's getting more full. And any moment now, it could spill all its moisture upon this thirsty earth. I know when I see clouds in the sky, that's part of what I'm seeing. There's a cloud of witnesses that have gone before us, saints. The Old Testament is full of them. Hebrews tells us about them. He mentions all kinds of names. I'm just going to mention a couple. I'm just preparing context for you about weights and sins. But what I need you to know is this. There's a cloud of witnesses that have gone before you. Some of them were sawn asunder. History says that Isaiah the prophet was sawn asunder. And he refused to relent. He refused to recant his message. How many people, they went through trial and tribulation, heartache and sorrow. Listen to me. Y'all have heard me say it before, but I'm going to say it again. We're spoiled in the American church. Listen, God is a blessing God. He is a God that releases prosperity. Test me in this, he said in Malachi. In other words, in your tithes and your offerings, test me in this. See that I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you're not even able to contain. God wants to bless his people in every way imaginable. Not to, not to feed your flesh, not to feed my flesh, but he wants to, he's a blessing God. He's a loving God. He brings hope. Amen. But at the same time, this world that we live upon has fallen. Do we see that? Have we fallen in love with this world? Help us, Lord, if we've fallen in love with this world. How much of this world tries to cling to us? How much do the, do the vines of the fall try to cling to us and wrap themselves around us and prevent us from moving forward in the things of God? The cloud of witnesses is a sign that others before us made a choice. They made a choice to be separate from the world as they joined the journey towards the heavenly city. They made a choice. There's more to this earth than occupation and money and power and fame or even family. People don't like to hear that. You know, God doesn't care. God loves family. God so loves family in the beginning. Amen. He made a man and wife. He, man and wife, and, 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 and he brought them together. Amen. God loves family. He does. But listen, if you're putting all your hope in family, your children, uh, your occupation, your money, your, your savings, come on, somebody. I'm not telling you don't save. That's not what I'm saying. You put all your hope in that. Look, dude, people talking about, oh, man, the, the people in, in power right now about to take your 401K. Oh, okay, guess what? He, I don't want them to. Uh, I, I, you know, I mean, let me, let me just stop there. Anyway, the point is, is that my hope is always going to be in the Lord. I got to trust in him. Amen. It doesn't mean I'm not going to save. You might save a different way than I do. Okay, I'm not preaching on finance. But I'm trying to make a point. Don't put your hope in that. Don't put your eyes in that. These things grow wings and fly away. Amen. He, you know, but, but nevertheless, these things will try to get us. And neither job nor money nor even family will sustain us. Only God is faithful. Everything, everyone will let you down. Even if it's just timing will let you down. What are you trying to say, preacher? How can timing let me down? Because the Lord might speak a word to your heart, and then you move forward, and Lord knows I can have done it like a bull in a china cabinet. Oh, yeah, the Lord told me this, and I'm busting through. 
Now, you better learn how to be patient on the Lord, brothers and sisters. You better learn to hear the voice of God. And you go out there running ahead of the Lord, and guess what? You're going to find yourself in all kind of trouble and a mess. Help us, Lord. We wander and we wonder and we ponder life with all uncertainty and question, what is the meaning of all of this and why am I even here? I can remember driving down the road before and seeing them beautiful clouds. You know, I've shared with y'all before, I think I got that from my mom, loving the clouds in the sky, you know, those pretty white ones. And I think it started actually, I don't know if it came from you, mom, or when we were on the plane and heading to Singapore as a kid and on that plane and flying through them clouds. And I just started thinking, man, this is God. As a kid, you know, about eight years old, maybe nine years old. Man, these clouds, man, this God made. I didn't even know nothing about God at the time. Well, anyway, I knew a little bit because God had been speaking to me as a kid. But what is the meaning of all of this? And later on in life, driving down the road and seeing the clouds in the sky and questioning, even as a Christian, there's got to be more. There's got to be more, Lord. I'm sitting over here and I'm weighted down with all of these things that are in my life. Surely there's more to you and my walk with you than this. Can I tell you what went wrong in my life? Maybe in your life, maybe right now, what went wrong? Let me tell you. Can I have permission? Can I have permission to tell you what went wrong? We were living in the wrong country. We settled down in the wrong city. We didn't read the part of the book. I know some of y'all read the book more than once. I'm just making a point. We didn't read the part of the book that explained to us that this place was not our home. Something all these heroes of faith had in common is that they realized that there must be a separation between them and this world. They got the, they got the revelation, my friend. You know, Wednesday night, I, uh, I did a little illustration. I pulled these two chairs up here, so if y'all were here. Now, I want you to know, you know, some of y'all, I know y'all pick on me. Oh, dude, here you go again. Repetitive. No, guess what? I didn't plan this out. I did not plan this out. The Lord told me preach on weights and sins. The Lord told me preach on submit and resist. It's not my fault that God keeps saying the same thing over and over again in his word. And when it's written on his word, we're going to preach it. God don't want his people bound up in the world. God doesn't want his people married to the world. There's a big old wor church world out there that calls itself the church, and I am not the Holy Spirit to judge which is this and what is that and all of that, but yet at the same time, the Lord will tell us when to call things out, all right? But for right now, I just want you to know that there's a big old thing that calls itself the church. It's a big old mammoth. I remember a preacher one time said, just because something's big don't mean it's healthy. And you, I mean, I'm just saying, you weigh 420 pounds, and it ain't healthy. What is the meaning of all of this? And so this world, you know, and I wanted to go back to that just for a second. So what I did was I said friendship with the world is enmity with God. You remember when I said that? I sat down in the chair, and I said, you know, the word friendship literally means fondness. And it's almost like what God wants his followers to understand is, is that he's not okay with us being fond with the world, to be friendly with the world. The word in the Greek is cosmos. That's where we get the word cosmic. Oh, cosmos, you've been so good to me. I'm still so fond of you. You got the best clothes, the best cars, the best houses. You got the best commercials, the best music. You have some good stuff, world. You're so bougie. Oh, my goodness, man, look at that, dude. I want what everybody else got that got that serving you. And, and then now that I know Jesus, I just want to have a little bit of both. I just want to tip my toe in the water a little bit and hold on to a little bit of my friendship with you. Everybody doesn't have to understand. I need you to know the word cosmos is where we get the word cosmic. Cosmic is a set order and arrangement of celestial bodies in the sky. God put it in arrangement is what I'm trying to tell you. This world that we live on has a set order of arrangement right now. If you don't know the Bible, you ain't gonna find, you'll find verses that describe it, but the whole 
Word of God is teaching us what the set order of arrangement is. And let me tell you what the set order of arrangement is. God created Adam in his own, he created him out of the pure, pristine soil of the earth that was not fallen. And he breathed his life into a lump of clay. But then Adam fell and sin came into the human race. And that all of mankind has been fallen. And then mankind re rebelled against God at Babel and said, no, we don't want you to be our God. You might not see it in the text, but I'm telling you, that's exactly what happened happen. How you know? Because there's ziggurats and pyramids all over the world. And in South America, they found 70,000 dead bodies where the Mayan Indians were worshiping this false god. And who do you think he was? He just reinvented himself. His name is Satan. He's the fallen angel. And, you know, listen, architects might think I'm crazy. Archaeologists might think I'm crazy, but they don't know what I know. And it's not that I'm something special. The Lord showed it to me in his word. This world together at Babel said, we don't want you to be our God. Just like Israel said, we want a king. And God gave them over to their free will. God gave them over. So in the set order of arranged things, the majority of the world is against God. And is being driven by a spirit. And you can call it whatever you want. I like to call it the spirit of Jezebel. This is a perfect personage of what, of what the spirit of the world is. She's the harlot that rides the beast in Revelation 17. And this spirit of antichrist that is upon the earth is, whether we like it or not, the said order of arrangement in the cosmos of which we live. The beauty of that is this. God sent his kingdom to this earth. The kingdom of God indwelling our master Jesus. Hallelujah. And then when he died, the light of the world. Amen. He died. He was buried. He resurrected. He ascended. And the Holy Spirit comes down. And when we hear the truth of the gospel and we become born again, I hope you're born again this morning. If you're not born again, you need to give your heart to Jesus. Well, how do I get born again, preacher? You call on the name of the Lord. You believe that you're a sinner. You believe Jesus died on the cross for your sin. You cry out to him and you invite him into your heart. And you ask forgiveness of your sin. And the Holy Ghost will come to live in you. He said it. Hallelujah. He said, me and my father will come to, to, dwell, to dine with you. You don't just invite anybody to your table, my friend. The Lord's inviting you to the table. Oh, we ought to start preaching on Mephibosheth right now, but let's not do that. The Lord is so good. Amen. And, 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 but that this world advised for our attention. And we, and we, still, we want to sit here, this, this cosmic order of arrangement. But listen, the kingdom of God now lives in you. Hallelujah. The kingdom of God now lives in you. God has a presence on this fallen earth, and even though this set order of arrangement of things is here and will be here till God turns the page and we, we find the finality of the book, and whether we're living in it or if we, we're not here when it happens, I don't know for sure, but it's getting close, that until that time, God's kingdom is cohabiting on the same earth as the kingdom of darkness. And God desires for his people to be translated from darkness into light. And how does that happen? Through salvation, through the preaching of the truth, through, through deliverance of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit moving in conjunction with the truth of God's word and the sacrifice, the finished work of Christ entering into our hearts. And now he desires to pull us away, to separate us. He's gonna really bring some separation one day, church. He's going to separate the chaff from the wheat. The chaff will be burned up and the wheat will be put into the storehouse. He's going to separate the sheep from the goats. Amen. He's going to separate the tares from the wheat. Praise God. And I want to be on the right end of that. Amen. So I don't want to be part of this orderly, this set orderly arrangement. I don't want to be part of this current world. I want to be separate. I want to be separate from this world. And so that's really what the idea was about this cloud of witnesses. This cloud of witnesses came to the revelation, even in the Old Testament, that there must be a separation between them and this world. I think it would be a beautiful message one day just to preach about these characters. But Abraham, what did God tell him? Come out of your father's house. Hallelujah. Come out of your father's nation, and I'm going to make a nation out of you. In other words, you can't stay where you are, Abraham. Your father is a maker of idols. I'm, I'm calling you to follow me. 
And, and, and he looked, the Bible says in Hebrews, if you read in the rest of chapter 11, he says, Abraham looked for a city which has foundations whose builder and maker is God. And, and it goes on to say in eleven thirteen, it says, these all died in faith, all of these followers. And they didn't even receive the promises. They saw them afar off. They believed, they embraced them, and they confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on this earth. You know what a pilgrim is? A pilgrim is somebody that's on a journey. I used to have an old, uh, old preacher, and I used to like it. He said, I remember him preaching a message one time about being a pilgrim. And he said, you know, when you're a pilgrim, I mean, I'm not saying that you don't plant trees because I love trees, okay? But the, here, it was an illustration. When you know you ain't staying long, you don't go around planting trees. And you don't go around hanging paintings on the wall. <laughs> Please, if you want to put paintings on your wall, put paintings on your wall. His point was, you don't plan on staying here long. I'm not going to do all this interior decorating because I'm about to leave this place. Don't Amen. Don't get comfy. That's right. Hallelujah. These all died in faith. They saw the promises, but they knew that they were strangers and pilgrims. It says in verses 14 through 16, they seek a country. And then it says, if they had been mindful of the country from where they came, they might have returned to the old place. Can I tell you this morning, it's not God's will for you to return to the old place. That old place ain't got nothing for you, Christian. You, if you in this house this morning, you convinced that God is real. And you convinced it's the one, oh, we got to clarify that nowadays. It's the one that sent his son Jesus to die for the sins of the human race. And because he had no sin, it was paid in full. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He came busting out of the grave. Death can't hold him down. He said it, I am the resurrection of the life. Hallelujah. He that believes in me will never die. Oh, that's good news for you, church. That's good news for me. Because guess what? This is just a temporary vapor. James said it, and I believe it. This is just a temporary, this is just a dress rehearsal right here for our eternity. They might have returned, but no, they didn't. They stayed, they, they continued on with the Lord. Hallelujah. A couple of them, I'm just going to say, I'm going to keep on going. I said, Abraham, Joseph's bones. You know, Joseph in verse 22 of chapter 11, he said this. I'm kind of paraphrasing. We're leaving here one day. Yeah, you know the story of Joseph, right? I mean, it, it, see, that's another thing. If you don't really know the Bible, it makes it hard, but that's okay. That's what I'm here for. Let me tell you a little bit about Joseph. Joseph was born of Jacob, and Jacob's name was changed to Israel, and he was one of the children of Jacob that, that became one of the tribes later on, at least in the book of Revelation. He ended up having two sons, but the point is the 12 tribes of Israel became the nation of Israel. And Joseph was very special in the eyes of his father, Jacob. But guess what? His brothers were envious and jealous, and they sold him into slavery. And he became, you know the story, he was lied upon. He ends up in a prison at some point in time, and he starts interpreting dreams. And then the Lord used him. The Lord used him to interpret dreams for the baker and the cupbearer. Remember that? And then he said, just don't forget me when you get out there. And when the time was right, God allowed his gift to come to the top, and God used Joseph in a mighty way. Joseph said, let me tell you about your dream, Pharaoh. There's going to be seven years of plenty, and then there's going to be seven years of wisdom. Look, that's a word of knowledge. You hear that? That's a gift of the Spirit, even in the Old Testament. The Lord gave him a gift to interpret a dream and said, this means famine. And now let me give you some wisdom. You're going to store up in the seven years to prepare for the seven years of famine. And when it was all said and done, man, you know what Joseph could have said? Egypt's been good to me. God used me in the midst of Egypt. Can I tell you, child of God, that God wants to use you in the midst of this world? God wants you to shine when everybody else is looking real dull. God wants you on the job to be the hardest worker with the best attitude. He wants you to be the most productive worker in your business. I'm telling you that right now. He don't want you walking around with bitterness, with a scowl on your face, all beat down and jacked up because the world is beating you up. It's beating everybody else up. He wants you lifted up. He wants a smile on your face. He wants you to weld more than anybody else can weld. He wants you to grind like a madman. He wants you to see more patience than anybody else can see. Because if you're going to give testimony to Jesus Christ, your work ethic is a reflection of the God you serve. 
Let me tell you something. Joseph was productive. I didn't plan on preaching on Joseph, but Joseph was productive. He was getting stuff done, my friend. And you know what? In the end, he said, Egypt ain't been bad to me. God has used me in the midst of Egypt. I'm part of his plan. You're part of his plan. And even in the midst of that, we're coming up out of here one day, gentlemen. And when we do, take my bones and bring them with you because this place is not my home. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Moses, when the time came right, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He said, I am not part of this. And he probably took him a while to get it. I'm not going to preach that. I could preach it. Well, how, yeah, I'm just going to leave it alone. The point is, is this. He knew he was not one of them. Circumcision told him that. I'm going to just say it. Covenant, sign of the covenant. Circumcision in the Old Testament is the type of the New Testament, the circumcision of your heart. The Holy Spirit wants to be the surgeon to, re to remove the flesh from our heart. Have your way with us, Lord. The point is, is that Moses said, I know that I don't belong here. And he separated himself. And God used him. Rahab the harlot. <laughs> Rahab chose not to perish with them heathen. <laughs> and Rahab said, I see the signs coming. I've heard the cry. I've heard the story that Yahweh has a people and that they're chewing up the kings that are out there. And, oh, Lord, I don't want to perish with these heathens. I'm going to hang that little scarlet cord right here, and I'm coming with you. I'm coming with you. I want to be part of what you're doing. Even Samson. This is the cloud of witnesses that went before us. I'm trying to tell you. I'm preparing the context for the weights and sins. There's a cloud of witnesses that have gone before Samson. I'm going to preach on Samson one day because the Lord gave me revelation. I ain't going to let all the cat out the bag right now. But I just want to say this. Samson was a mess, my friend. Samson was a mess. Was he not? He was. And, 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 and look, he took some things for granted. But yet at the same time, in the end, you know what he did? Lord. Give me the strength that I need. I'm blinded. I've been grinding. I've been binded. But, oh, Lord, I know even though I married Delilah, even though I rebelled against you, even though I went the wrong way and connected myself to things that were not of you, oh, Lord, in the end, I'm separate from these people, and you are the God of victory, and this enemy needs to fall in the name of Jesus. Use me one last time. Samson was part of the people of God. Samson, in the end, Hallelujah, gave glory to God. And you know what the scripture says in 11 and 38? It says this, the world was not worthy of them. I want to, uh, listen, I know I use a lot of words, and I don't so much apologize for that, but I do want to bring some emphasis to this right now. As God continues to move in your life and gives you the boldness that he wants you and I to have for our normal everyday lives, you, do, you don't even have to raise your hand, but I know that y'all do understand that God's people are supposed to look different than the world. And that God's people are supposed to be used by him outside the walls of this church. And that me going out and knocking on the door just to say, hey, I just was curious what you think about Jesus is maybe different than the way however God uses you when you run into an old friend in Walmart. I get that. But he wants to use us none the same. And as he begins to use you and you feel persecution because because you will. The more you're used by God, there's going to be times that you will feel the anointing of the Lord move through you, and you'll be like, man, that was better than jumping off a bungee cord. That was good. That was the most exciting thing that I've ever experienced, a one-on-one -on -one witness episode, a witnessing session where the Holy Spirit, I could feel it, flowing through me and bringing hope to somebody that was lost. There ain't nothing better on earth than that, my friend. And when you feel it, you're going to know what I'm talking about. But guess what? There's also going to be times when they're going to roll their eyes. They're going to be like, please. Like that time I told you, I know I keep telling the same stories. At the Shrimp and Petroleum Festival, talking, hey, man, let me give you this. Jesus, oh, man, yeah, my mama told me about Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny, too. Look, the, the world may come against you, but you know what the Word of God says in Hebrews? The world was not worthy of them. Now I want to transition into weights and sins. We establish that there's a cloud that has gone before us, and they all had something in common, and the commonality was the fact that they did not love this world, and they chose instead to separate their lives from the world because they chose instead to live for God. I got to tell you that in this current cosmos or orderly arrangement that this world is full of a lot of bad stuff. 
right? You know, I felt like the Lord was showing me the other night that the world is filled with weights and sin. What is a weight? A weight is a burden. A weight is an encumbrance. It's kind of like, that's why I put this on. I mean, I knew y'all didn't really think I was trying to exercise up here. <laughs> a, weight, a weight is a burden. It, it, it encumbers me, and it, it kind of tries to slow me down a little bit. You know, not every weight is a sin, but every sin is a weight. You know? I didn't come up with that. I wish I did. <laughs> I don't know who did. I've heard it for a long time. But it's true. Not every weight is a sin, but every sin is a weight. And can I tell you something? That a lot of times the weights that have jumped on us, it wasn't none of our fault to begin with at all. It just has to do with the fall of this earth. I was sharing something with Robert on the phone that I'll tell him, but I ain't telling none of y'all. It was just weird. Some weird stuff happens. <laughs> weird stuff happens to you sometimes when you're a kid from other people. I told Rob, I'm like, dude, and I told him the story. I ain't about to say this. It's embarrassing. <laughs> But, like, it's just weird, bro. Like, why that happen? Because this world is fallen and it's perverted and it's sick. And then one thing I happened to you, and the thing that happened to me isn't even near as bad as some of the stuff that's probably happened to many of y'all. And that wasn't your fault. Whatever has happened to you, whatever people did to you, but it's a weight. Oh, it put a weight on you. You try, you can try to pretend it didn't happen. That ain't going to work. And then another thing happened another way. And then another thing happened in another way. And then you get into your teenage years and you got your little girlfriends. I don't know, however you did back in the day. You got your friend friends or whatever. And then they, you know, it, look, I've seen it in, in the life of girls, but it also happens in guys where, where all of a sudden you're friends with somebody and then they start treating somebody like, dude, why do we act like that? But it hurts. When people blast you, that's what they talk about out there in the world today. Oh, he's blasting me, or he's throwing shade, or they roasting me, or they bullying me. All of this stuff that's happening. <clears throat> you know? Sometimes we deserve it. I can remember, I've told you all this story before. I used to hang, always hung out with people that were tougher and, and could fight better than me. And they were usually always older than me. Why I did that to myself, I don't know. Nevertheless, I can remember being at the rodeo one time at Blackham Coliseum in Lafayette, Louisiana, and I was talking so much trash to my friends. I was like, dude, y'all ain't doing nothing, bro. Y'all can't hang with them, you know, all this stuff. And they're like, all right, let's get him because this boy been running his mouth too long. They held me down. They took all my clothes off. They left me my underwear, thank God. And they threw my underwear. That's how much of an obnoxious person I was. And I was running around in the hay trying to, dude, you know what, that kind of affected my psyche a little bit for a little bit. I'm just like, dude, I need to be, like, calmed down a little bit. I need, that, that's a weight, you know? Kind of, like, hurt me, <laughs> you know? You get the point. I'm making fun, fun of it, but real stuff happens. You know, I've, I've seen, I, I recently, the Lord, when, it, when the Lord gave me this message, I saw some of y'all. I did. I saw, I could see. I mean, Hannah's not here tonight, and I don't mean to call her out. I know... Hannah's not here, but, you know, I could see Hannah as a, sp a specific person. I think she'd be okay with me saying that. Something happened to her. And what I mean is because something's happened to all of us is what I'm trying to say. I don't know specifics. I don't know specifics about many of your lives, but I guarantee you something somewhere. And, you know, I know Hannah well enough to know this. I've heard stories before how she told me when she was 11, 12 years old, how she'd be sitting in the bed flipping the pages of Scripture. And I've talked to her enough about the Bible to know that she knows a lot about the Bible. And I see that, I can see that young girl flipping through the pages of Scripture, wanting to be a servant of the Lord, wanting to know, to learn the things of God, and yet at the same time, the world trying to throw weights on her. Trying to, I thought about you too, Amanda, the same thing. The world trying to throw weights on us. Every last one of us in this place, none of us are immune. The world has tried to throw weights on us. And we carry these burdens around. And they try to slow us down. And the word of the Lord said, lay them aside. Lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily besets us. I'm not trying to give you a Greek class this morning, but I will say this, that laying aside in the Greek right there is in the middle voice. What does that mean? Well, the active voice means that the subject is actually doing the action. The passive voice means that the 
action is being done to the subject. And in the middle voice, there's like a cooperation. He's part of producing the action, but in some way, the action's also working on him. What is your point, preacher? My point is, is that as strong, as important as faith in Christ and his finished work is, you got a part to play. There's time and again this word in the Greek language about koinonia. It means communion. It means, and 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 it means. submit. Okay, come over here. I want to teach you how to resist. But at some point in time, he's saying, submit and resist to me. Work with me. Join with me. Be in unity with me in the moving and operation of my Holy Spirit when I speak to you and I tell you that something is wrong and it's hurting you. Lay it aside. Hallelujah. Lay it aside. Thank you, Lord. Help us, Lord God, to do what you've called us to do, to cooperate and agree with the Holy Spirit. This passage that we read, it describes a race set before us, the pilgrimage, the journey of living for God. So what are we working with the Holy Spirit of God when we are casting off weights and sins? We're working with the Lord. We need to work with the Lord. So we move from weights to sins because, you know, from weight people oftentimes turn to sins, right? We turn to sins because we're hurt. And we just want the pain to stop. I I understand it. I didn't understand it when I was in it, but I understand it better now. You know, and I, and I know that I've told y'all the story before. I mean, much of the pain, and I don't mean to be redundant, but much of the pain in my life I feel like did come from my dad. And, and I do realize, I do believe that my dad meant well. Like, he really, I do, but he wasn't, can I say he was a good man? The Bible says ain't nobody good. But my point is, is that I don't think he was wicked in that he just was a product of his environment. And I've told y'all, I knew he loved me, and I know it's gross, but how do you know he loved you, Matt? Because he never said it really too much, because one day when I had snot coming out my nose as a kid, he took his T-shirt and said, blow it on this, boy. Somebody that hates you doesn't let you blow their snot on their T-shirt. Anyway, that's my revelation of my love from God. I mean, my love from dad. And that'll mess you up understanding the love of the father. Because when our own daddies don't act right. But, you know, he was a product of his own life. He, he would say, boy, I wish you could have met my daddy, Matthew. You would have liked him. I was like, oh, yeah. He's like, he was something, boy. He said, one day I saw, I turned down the hallway and I saw him kicking Thomas up and down the hallway and, I, and, and when I found out what it was later, uh, it had something to do with uh, whenever his, they had one sister, and she ended up becoming a nun, and she went up, and she went to go kiss, I don't remember how the story went, went to go kiss, the daddy went to go kiss the daughter, because that's the only one he'd show affection to, but somehow he had his hand up in the air, and I think Thomas, for some reason, thought he was about to strike the sister, and he grabbed his daddy's arm, (laughs) and my dad said, oh, Lord, that was a mess, and what I'm trying to say is, is that he was a rough, rough character, and he, and that's how he raised my dad, and, and so what I'm trying to get at is, is that all of those weights, and then the weights from his life, because he didn't understand God. He did, under, he did understand enough to say this. He's like, son, I don't understand everything about religion, but I remember my mama told me when I was hanging out with them Baptist boys down the road that I was going to go to hell. And I didn't tell her that, but I thought to myself, that ain't true. <laughs> them Baptist boys acting better than I do. I know that that ain't true. You know, so there was a soft spot in his heart and in his life. But, you know, the weights of life wore him down, and he turned to drinking. And that just made things worse. And then the weights that he poured upon me caused me to turn to drinking, caused me to go to other things. Sins added on top of weights open up spiritual doors. Now we got the enemy a foothold up in the house, and it's a mess. And we need deliverance, church. We need deliverance, and we need healing. And I'm here to tell you, I know the one that can do it. His name is Jesus, hallelujah. Let me clarify that. I know the one that's already done it. 
We just need the manifestation of it in our life. We just need him to release it into our life. We just need revelation of it. We need our eyes to be opened and our ears to be opened. Jesus wants to cast these things off. Can you turn real quick uh, with me, Miss Sandy, to Matthew chapter 11, verse 29 through 30. We're going to go ahead and let the musicians come forward because we're about to close up. In Matthew chapter 11, verses 29 through 30, Jesus said, take my yoke upon you. You know what I noticed right there is that the word take is actually in the active voice. I don't mean to go on and on, but since I mentioned the middle voice, let me go ahead and mention the active voice. And, and to understand that the Lord is saying, you're the subject of this testimony right here. Take my yoke. I've provided a yoke for you. Now take it upon yourself. Now, we've talked about what a yoke is many a time, but it's a piece of instrumentation, a farm implement that connects two beasts of burden together so that the work of the Lord can be done. He says, take my yoke upon you, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. The Lord is saying, won't you take my yoke upon you this morning, won't you? Let me ease the burden in your life. Turn with me real quick, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, and we're closing with this verse. Casting is what the word says. Casting, active voice. Casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Active voice, Lord, I take these cares, these anxieties, these worries, these burdens. I take these burdens these weights that have tried to jump on me and I just, I cast them off. I throw them off and I give them to you, Lord. I don't want them anymore. I don't want these weights and these burdens anymore. I don't want the things that I've turned to to try to solace my pain. I don't want it. I want you, Lord. I want to be separate from you. Amen. Listen, as they begin to sing, if you be led, I want you to come. I want you to come and, be, and spend time with the Lord. Amen. Let us spend time in the presence of the Lord. And let us use our mouth and our lips to tell the Lord what we desire release from, what we need freedom from, the burdens that we need him to remove from us. Amen. Praise God. Let's worship the Lord. Hallelujah.